Because Jung, what he did in that book basically was investigate the fantasy that he believed that all of Western civilization had been predicated on for the last 4,000 years. Now, because Jung really believed that what drove human beings was, and it, it's a Piagetian perspective in some weird ways, was the revelation of the successive unconscious revelation of fantasies were at the forefront of the, our movement into unknown territory. So it's like there's unknown territory, and then there's known territory, but there's this weird intermediary space between them. And that intermediary space where you kind of know but kind of don't know, that's where your imagination plays. And of course that's the case, right? Because when you encounter something and you really don't know much about it, you imagine what it might be. And so it takes on the structures of your imagination. And so in some sense, what you're dealing with as you move through history, you expand your domain of knowledge into the unknown, is you encounter your own fantasy. Now, so Jung took this problem that Nietzsche had posed seriously, because Jung was caught up quite dramatically in the events of, of, of Nazi Germany. Now, you know, when we think about Nazi Germany, we think, of course, that it was perfectly obvious that the Nazis were the were the perpetrators and that you know everyone else was the victim and that if we were there we would have clearly seen that and we wouldn't have been Nazis and it's like that's not true that isn't how it worked because these things happen slowly they sort of happen piece by piece you know we started seeing a similar thing happen I think after the after the Twin Towers fell in New York you know it's like people gave up five ten percent of their civil liberties in, in like a, a month you know and 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 it was okay. It was like, it wasn't okay. It wasn't okay. And it just shows you how easy that sort of thing can, can start. You know, the Germans were under tremendous stress in the 1930s. Their whole economy blew out. They had to, like, take wheelbarrows full of billions of marks to buy a piece of bread. Their currency fell to zero. Unemployment was staggeringly high. They were paying off debts like mad because of the First World War. And there was a real threat that the communists were going to start a revolution. It's like, you don't have problems like that. So... The, the, the Germans had no idea what to do, you know, and, and Hitler was a, a canny, canny person with a brilliant, brilliant sense of drama. I mean, he was a real, he was a master of dark fire, that guy, and I think his, his unconscious fantasy was, let's see how much we can destroy before we die in the, in the what, purifying flames. That was Hitler. So, and he was... He was a compelling person, and the fantasy that he had in the back of his mind, I'll tell you how that developed at one point. It was a very hard thing to escape from. And that's why the Germans became Nazis. It wasn't like, this was like magic that had emerged, and it was black magic. So Jung was very interested in this, because he was in the Germanic-speaking areas of the world when this happened, and he felt, felt himself pulled very strongly by what the Nazis were doing, especially in the early stages of the development of the political platform, because things did stabilize, you know, and then they stabilized before they went completely out of control, and of course, looking in retrospect, you can see the seeds of what eventually transpired to become such a catastrophe, but at the time, it was by no means self-evident that such a thing was going to occur, especially given all the other horrible things that were likely to occur. So, Jung had a, had a vision at one point in, on a train, I think it was in Switzerland, that Europe had become so covered with blood that the blood was starting to flow over the mountains into Switzerland, because of course Switzerland is neutral. And he said it was one of the most horrifying nightmares of his life. And this was in, I think, 1930. It was late, late 1930s, anyway. So it was a premonition of war. And he spent a lot of time trying to understand, well, if you weren't going to become a fascist and worship the state, and you weren't going to become a nihilist, and worship nothing, what in the world were you going to do exactly to orient yourself? And how would you protect yourself against the attractions of blind state identification, for example, or the attractions of nihilism? You know, you might say, well, nihilism has no attraction at all because it says to you, everything is irrelevant, nothing you do has any importance, because that's nihilistic, basically. Well, what's the, what's the, the psychoanalyst would say, what's the secondary gain from that? Like, yeah, you say that's what you believe, and maybe you even act it out. And you also say, well, you've come to that conclusion through, you know, a rational process of deliberation. But the psychoanalyst would say, it's kind of convenient that that also alleviates you of all responsibility, isn't it? And it kind of sheds a little 
dampness on your claim to pristine cognition as the driving force between, you know, behind your adoption of that theory. You know, it's like, it's like the patriot who claims that, you know, the reason that he's kicking someone in the head is because he's patriotic. It's like, no, no, no. You're patriotic so that you can kick someone in the head and still look at yourself in the mirror in the morning. It has nothing to do with rational deliberation. And so the psychoanalysts, and Jung was like this in particular, you know, they were always extremely skeptical about people's rational claims about their commitments to ideology, and rightly so. One of the things Jung said that I love, was he said some things that were so brilliant, was that people didn't have ideas. Ideas had people. And when you think that I... See, it's like, it's like... I think this is so funny. It's like Dawkins' idea of the meme. You know, some of you... How many of you read Dawkins? He's, you know... Yeah, okay. So Dawkins has this idea of meme. It's so funny to read Dawkins because he's like 20% of the way to being a union without even knowing it. And so he's produced this idea called meme, which is these I, they're ideas. A meme is an idea that sort of has an independent existence in a sense because it can infect different minds or move from mind to mind. And he kind of thinks of it more like a fad. Well, the archetypes are memes, except they're no fads. They're memes that have lasted for like 20,000 years, or maybe 20 million years. We have no idea how old they are. And Jung got where Dawkins was going like, you know, 50 years before and 200 stories deeper. So it's so funny to read Dawkins because what he is searching for has already been figured out by Jung, but he's so prejudiced against any kind of religious thinking that there's no way he'll ever find it. So 